What's good everybody, this is Hoop Intellect and welcome back to the channel. Now today we've got the second edition of my 2020 NBA Draft Big Board. The first was just 30 deep but today we'll go all the way to 60. More time and being able to review and adjust scouting reports has made this list a lot more accurate than the previous one. For the sake of time we'll roll through the last 20 to 30 while discussing the most interesting guys, some significant changes and get more detailed as we move on. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get it started. Starting off with the last 10, this is the area where a lot of guys could show up at, so I'm working on this part the most. There are a lot of talented but flawed guards here with Skylar Mays, Tyshawn Alexander, Ashton Higgins, Miles Powell, and Jay Scrub. And we also have a few bigs with various play styles, from the stretch four with Killian Tilly to the rim runners in Nick Richards and Hidoka Azabuki. If you don't recognize the name Jay Scrub, it's because he went to John Logan College at Juco in Louisville, Kentucky. I don't have a ton of access to his film, but from the few games I've seen and a couple highlights, the dude is really talented and definitely deserves to get legitimate draft attention. Miles Powell was one of the best players in college basketball this season, but he's inefficient and I've got major questions about the rest of his game. But in this area of the draft, a guy like Miles Powell is someone you would love to have as a part of your organization. For the bigs, Killian Tilly is the classic stretch four. He definitely has the potential to go much higher in this draft, but he's also one of the more injury prone guys. We've got Yudoka Azabuki, who is one of the most important players for one of the best teams in the country. He's really good at what he does. Runs the floor, block shots, rebounds, and he's pretty explosive, especially at his size. He's limited skill wise and as a passer, and can't shoot free throws, and isn't a reliable defensive option in space but he's somebody who's a great value pick in the late 40s, even though a few things may need to happen for him to see time. And this group is where we get into the biggest tier of players in the draft. There isn't a lot that separates these guys from each other, as they all project as solid role guys at their best. I think this is where you'll find the best value. While there aren't really any guys who project as superstars in this draft, there are a ton who can be solid role guys for 10 plus years, especially as we get into the lower 40s. Leading off the second group is Trace Tinkle at the 50 spot. He's the all-time leading scorer at Oregon State and a guy who really caught my eye watching Pac-12 games. Malachi Flynn specifically has a lot of potential with an Austin Rivers-like game. He's somebody who I wouldn't be surprised went higher than some of the bigger school guards. Israeli guard Yam Madar really caught my eye while watching Denny Avdia. He's performed well in big games and is worthy of a draft and stash selection. He's crafty beyond his years and a real competitor. He's definitely a sleeper pick. Emmanuel Quickly was Kentucky's best player down the stretch of the season. He's got a lot of Malik Muck in his game, and it's not just because he wore the five for the Wildcats. In my opinion, it's just about preference and potential as we get into the 45 to early 30s range. On to the next section. There are a lot of versatile defenders in this section. Guys like Robert Woodard II, Paul Reed, Reggie Perry, they all have a lot of upside on that end of the floor. I really like the experienced guards Cassius Winston, Trey Jones, and Peyton Pritchard. They all have very different games but have high IQs and are team first guys who aren't necessarily relying upon high scoring numbers to be effective. 32, I have Elijah Hughes out of Syracuse. I'm really high on Hughes, but like I said before, most of these guys are in the same tier. Hughes is one of those you won't understand his appeal if you just focused on his shooting percentages. He did it all for Syracuse and by proxy took a lot of tough shots. The thing is, he's one of the smoothest and most effective wings off the dribble in the draft and I like his potential in a more focused 3 and D role at the next level. Alexei Pokusevsky rounds off this section. I feel like I had Poku a bit too high the first time, but he definitely has high potential, especially offensively. The fact that we really haven't seen him against high level and physical competition worries me a bit, so I'm more comfortable having him in this spot. Now let's get into the top 30. We've got Isaiah Stewart coming in at number 30. Again, I like the energy he brings to the game, he rarely hesitates when he takes shots, and I think he has a definite role at the next level. He also has a bit more skill than he was able to show at Washington. At 29, I have Nico Mannion. I left him off the first time, but I think his potential is too high to leave him out the first round. He's got a lot of questions as a shooter and with his defensive effort, but I like what he's got, especially in this draft. Leandro Bomaro at 28, he's definitely a potential pick. I think it'll take him a couple years before he's ready for NBA level basketball, 
but he's definitely someone with a high level of skill and versatility. I love Tyler Bay's potential as a two-way player. I like his lateral quickness on the perimeter a lot more than other forwards in this draft. And offensively, he provides vertical spacing around the rim, and he showed potential as a shooter, though he still must improve there. Tyrell Terry has high potential as a shooter, but has some questions defensively, and at his size, it's always more difficult to be highly effective in this league. Now, Grant Riller is one of the most talented offensive players in this draft. Coming out of the College of Charleston, Riller is an explosive scoring guard who at his advanced age should be able to do that right away in the NBA. Jalen Smith has the rare combo of rim protection and three point prowess. I like his value in the later part of the first round. I think the structure of a good organization could really unlock his abilities as he continues to work on and improve his body. Patrick Williams has high potential as a jack of all trades kind of guy. He projects as someone who can guard multiple positions, knock down threes, and display a solid base as a shot creator. Definitely wouldn't be mad at any team who took a chance on him in the late lottery range. RJ Hampton is one of the most popular guys in this draft, so for a lot of people, having him anywhere outside the top 14 is taken as disrespect. I'll say that I had him too low on the initial big board, and based on potential alone, 21 feels like a good place. You can find the scouting video on the channel to see some of the reasons why I feel this way. I've uploaded videos on everyone in this section outside of Bull Morrow and Stewart, so if you want a bit more info on these guys, you can check those out. The top 20 isn't much different than last time, but there are a few big changes. Starting it off is Theo Maladon, the 6'5 guard out of France. Maladon showed enough to be considered all the way up into the late lottery. He already has that high level experience that some of these guys lack and has been mentored by NBA legend Tony Parker for years. At 19, we got Desmond Bain. Bain is a bulldog 3 and D guy with great playmaking skills. He doesn't have a super high ceiling, but I'm confident in his ability to contribute early and carve out a role quicker than some of the others. If you've watched my videos, you know how I feel about Jemias Ramsey. Dude's got great footwork and a knack for scoring the ball. If he can hone in on the defensive end and better use that athletic ability that I know he has, he can become a high impact guy. The moments where he floats and looks lost are the reason he's comfortably at 18 and not flirting with the lottery. Despite his struggles, you can make a case that Jaden McDaniels is the most talented guy in this class. Now how accurate that argument would be is another thing, but there's no denying how rare it is to be 6'10 with a nice handle, touch, scoring ability, and athleticism. Precious Achua became a much more appealing prospect as the year progressed. He started playing more five, and I think his versatility defensively puts him firmly in the top 20. Obviously, he needs to improve as a shooter, but offensively, his athletic ability matched with a handle serve as a nice base to build on for a prospect. Aaron Nesmith is the premier three-point shooter in this draft. He shot 52% on eight three-point attempts a game. If he had any semblance of a handle and was a bit better defensively, he might have cracked my top 10. That's just how good of a shooter he was this year. Getting into the lottery, we have Tyrese Maxey. Now Maxey intrigues me defensively. He has that dog in him when he's locked in and a confidence offensively that you just can't teach. In the mid to late teens, you can't go wrong with a guy like Max. Sadiq Bey takes the 13th spot. In the modern NBA, wings who can guard multiple positions and hit threes are the hottest commodity. The most important thing to get out of the draft is someone who will contribute to your team. Everybody you pick won't be a star, but they've gotta be a contributor, and I think Bey can do that. Cole Anthony comes in at number 12. Anthony will undoubtedly benefit from NBA pace and spacing. Unless he somehow goes to the Knicks, he should look better, especially around the rim. I think he's a good bet to be a solid scorer in the league, it's just the rest of his game that holds him back for me. Holding down the 11 spot is Isaac Okoro. At the very worst, Okoro should be a rotational defensive wing. There are a lot of questions about the rest of his game, but again, when you can and are willing to guard multiple positions at a high level, NBA teams are willing to take a chance on you and help develop the rest of your game. Now we finally reached the top 10. At 10, I have Devin Vassell. He's moved up a couple spots from last time, and I'll admit it may be because I've been watching how good Mikhail Bridges has developed over the last couple years. He's not the scorer Bridges was coming out of college, but they have very similar games and body types, and he projects as a guy who will do a lot of the things Bridges does well. Number nine, we've got my guy Kyra Lewis Jr. He's definitely one of my favorites in this draft and my biggest sleeper based upon how most of these mock drafts have gone. His speed and play style is reminiscent of De'Aaron Fox and I just think he has the tools to be a high impact guard in this league. Eight is Tyrese Halliburton out of Iowa State. He's a really solid and safe pick. He'll surely be a contributor in the NBA. 
He just has a really smooth and composed game. And though he may not have the ceiling of guys like Killian Hayes and LaMelo Ball, he's not far off in terms of current ability. Number seven is the high flyer Obi Toppin. Toppin would definitely be on my short list of most entertaining college basketball players ever. He's a ridiculous dunker and one of the most efficient scorers in college basketball history. Definitely has some major questions defensively, but in this draft, I think you take his upside and roll with whatever comes out of it. Number six, I have Denny Abdia. Now I had him number three last time and nothing really changed in the way I feel about him. I just did some thinking about his potential role in the NBA thought about whether or not he has the aggression or assertiveness to be considered a top three prospect. I love his game and he's been lighting it up overseas, but I feel a bit better about the guys that have left on the board. Now with number five comes the former number one overall recruit, James Wiseman. There's still a lot of unknowns with Wiseman, but there's a high chance he ends up being the number one pick just based off what we've seen from him and that ridiculous athletic ability. Fourth on the board is Killian Hayes. Hayes is just really fun to watch. He's a crafty lefty with an array of moves and a great pace to his game. At 6'5", he has great size with an athletic ability that can make him a better version of D'Angelo Russell. He's one of the guys I can't wait to see on NBA courts. Now at number 3 is Onyeka Okongwu. Okongwu has rapidly improved since he was a freshman in high school and I don't think he's going to stop anytime soon. He's one of the more agile bigs in defending in space and I think he'll be an immediately good rim runner and lob threat and grow into a real problem offensively. My number one and two guys are the same from last time. Number two is Anthony Edwards, and number one is LaMelo Ball. I know a lot of you just don't like LaMelo because you hate LaVar, and that's your decision, but he's really talented and you shouldn't let your emotions take away from enjoying his game. If Lonzo has shown us anything, it's that finishing is very important. As long as Melo has that floater working, he'll be fine early. Otherwise, it could get a little rocky, but that's just something random that was on my mind. As for Anthony Edwards, I honestly look at him as 1B. There's not a drastic difference in the prospects of these guys in my opinion. Thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a like, comment, subscribe, and check out the other videos on the channel. Let me know who you think I'm sleeping on. I'm always down to hear everyone's opinion and the comments on the last video weren't as malicious as I thought they'd be, and hopefully they stay that way. Anyways, this is Hoopin' Elect, I am Keandre, and I'm out.